Good afternoon, everyone. I know you are in a hurry to go home. So the talk is on Halex Valgus, but let's start off with a different note. Uh, I'm sure most of the boys would know her. Uh, if you, any one of you pretend that you don't know her, this is Victoria Beckham. Uh, but if you, beautiful lady, if you look at her feet, her feet are wonky. She's got a, a sig significant Halex Valgus. This has come in photographed by all the paparazzis all the time. So if you look at her footwear, you can see the kind of shoes she's wearing. So obviously, footwear has a role in Halex Valgus deformity. The, coming to the causes of Halex Valgus deformity, uh, heredity has a role because it's mostly seen in Western population. In India, it's rather rare. In India, one of the commonest causes is uh, rheumatoid arthritis with significant uh, Halex, Halex Valgus and lesser toe deformities. The primary pathology here starts off on the medial side with weakening of tissues. Then you get uh, the, the adductor, hallus, adductor hallucis on, on the lateral side pulls the, uh, the P1, the proximal phalanx, into hallux valgus position. The sesamoids dislocate and the deformity progresses gradually. Uh, as a trainee, uh, you need to know a few, uh, few angles. Uh, the most important from a patient perspective is the hallux valgus angle. That is what the patient sees. So this is the angle between the, the proximal phalanx and the long axis of the first metatarsal. This angle is roughly less than 15 degrees. Most important from a clinical, from a, from a decision-making point of view is the intermetatarsal angle, which is between the long axis of the first and the second metatarsals. It's between 9 and 11 normally. Any, any value less than 11 is normal. Third value, which is a bit confusing, is the DMAA. It stands for Distal Metatarsal Articular Angle. So it's the angle between a perpendicular to the long axis of the metatarsal and another line between the medial and lateral edges of the articular surface. It's de it denotes the inclination of the articular surface in relation to the metatarsal shaft. So the DMM, DMAA is normally less than 10. So from a trainee point of view, if you are asked a question about what are these angles, if you say that uh, the angles are normally less than 10 to 15, you are going to be correct. So you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to remember all of these values by heart, but you can roughly say that it's less than 10 to 15, you are going to be correct. So symptom, symptomatically, uh, it's mostly a cosmetic deformity, but it's not just purely a cosmetic deformity. Patients can get pain over the bursa or the bunion. Uh, you can have transfer metatarsal pain. This is a very common symptom with uh, hallux valgus. What happens is that when with hallux valgus, the first metatarsal elevates a bit, so the lesser metatarsals become uh, start to bear more weight, and there will be pain over the lesser metatarsal heads. This is called transfer metatarsalgia. Then when hallux valgus becomes severe, it pushes the second toe out of the way, causing a hammer toe deformity. It's commoner in the second toe. All you need is a weight-bearing x-ray uh, for this, uh, as far as investigations are concerned. Uh, the treatment of this is conservative and surgical, as you all know. The conservative management, uh, you can try toe spacers, taping and all that. But once there is an established hallux valgus, and none of it is going to be very helpful. From a patient, patient point of view, uh, these are uh, patients' objectives of, uh, if they are looking for surgery, that they should have no bump, they should have a straight toe, fairly mobile without any pain. From a surgeon point of view, you are looking at a congruent joint uh, with a good joint space and metatarsal length relatively well preserved. This is a concept. The metatarsal length concept is something which uh, most of the foot and angle surgeons are very, very keen to stress about these days. Because previously, osteotomies like Mitchell osteotomy, which is a step-cut osteotomy, reduced the metatarsal length. What it does is, if the first metatarsal length is reduced, the second metatarsal and the third metatarsal becomes more load-bearing, and they get pain, uh, they get what is, what is again called as the transfer metatarsal pain. So, if you don't preserve the metatarsal length of the first one, you can have transfer metatarsal pain. So, you are, uh, you are aiming for an operation which should preserve the metatarsal length. So, like I said uh, yesterday, all examination is about classification. So, you, you have to have a classification system in your mind if you are asked about the treatment options. So, you can broadly divide them into soft tissue procedures and brony procedures. Among the soft tissue procedures, uh, one of the common procedures that is commonly done along with the bony procedure is a lateral release. What it means is you uh, open up the, uh, the MTP joint on the lateral aspect, release the adductor halluses, 
and the intermetatarsal ligament to correct the deforming force. Uh, we will come to McBride's uh, uh, procedure in a, in, a, in a bit. So as far as bony procedures are concerned, you have got joint sparing procedures, which are mainly osteotomies, and you have got joint sacrificing procedures. In the joint sparing ones, you have got osteotomies at different levels. They have all got fancy names. I don't know whether you need to remember all those. And uh, from a joint sacrificing point of view, you have got excision arthroplasty, which is called Keller's arthroplasty. This is generally an excision of the proximal half, sorry, proximal half of the P1, of the proximal phalanx. Uh, this is generally a bad operation. These days, uh, I don't think there is any role for this operation because gen generally it causes transfer metatarsal pain and uh, cock up deformity and all that. Fusion is a very good operation, for especially first MTP joint fusion for uh, degenerate arthritis, uh, secondary to hallux valgus. So broadly, the guidelines of treatment are these. If it is IMI is less than 14, you go for a chevron osteotomy. If the IMI is from 14 to 20, you go for a scarf osteotomy, which I will come to in a bit. And if the uh, uh, valgus is more than 20, you go for a scarf or a proximal osteotomy or a TMT fusion. So generally, if the deformity is mild, you go for a distal osteotomy. As the deformity gets progressively increased, you go for a proximal osteotomy. Uh, this is another specific group of patients, uh, you know, with hypermobility. Those patients, uh, you can examine them. Uh, when you examine them, if you do the squeeze test, what is what you do is you squ squeeze the TMT joints, and if you can correct the deformity, uh, then they are likely to require a first TMT joint fusion as opposed to osteotomies, because osteotomies have a higher recurrence rate in patients with hypermobility. These are common in adolescent hallux valgus patients. So, uh, in patients with hallux valgus and degeneration, first MTP joint fusion is a very good option. Uh, Keller's, like I said, this is Keller's, is an example of Keller's. This is a, n not a good operation at all. Generally, the patients are, have very poor results with this operation. Uh, if there is hallux valgus interphalangeus, this is another concept where you have got a deformity between the P1 and the P2. Then you can do what's called as an Aikin osteotomy, which is there. You do an osteotomy of the base of the P1 to correct the interphalangeal hallux valgus. So let's just uh, take operations one by one. You've got a simple bunionectomy where you just do uh, remove the bunion. This is post this uh, surgery has generally has no role in uh, hallux valgus. Uh, the recurrence rates are high. The patient satisfaction rate is very poor. McBride's operation is removal of medial eminence, release of the conjoint tendon, and then removal of the fibula sesamoid. This again has got a fairly poor, uh, poor satisfaction rate. As you can see here, operation was described in 1928 before the internal fixation techniques and all came along. So this again has got rather poor results. Generally, this is not advocated these days. Chevron is a very commonly done procedure. It's a useful osteotomy. You do a, uh, what you do is you do this chevron osteotomy, which is distal osteotomy, and, trans and uh, shift the metatarsal laterally. The common complications are recurrence and avascular necrosis if you are not very careful with the soft tissues. Mitchell's osteotomy is a step cut osteotomy, like I said, you make a step cut, you remove a bit of the bone and transfer the metatarsal head laterally. Um, you can fix it either with a dental wire kind of thing or you can put in a screw to fix it, uh, or KYS even. But this shortens the, shortens the metatarsal, so the risk of transfer metatarsal pain is very high. So you should remember that the main complication of hallux valgus surgery is not on the first ray itself. It's mostly on the second ray in, in form of transfer metatarsal pain. Uh, so in, in view of this, uh, scarf osteotomy was proposed by Dr. Sir Prof. Louis Baruch in Bordeaux. Um, the indications of scarf are pretty much same as the uh, same as the normal osteotomies. Generally, most foot and ankle surgeons across Europe and uh, in many centers in America now do is as a routine, as a, as a standard procedure for all hallux valgus oper operations because it's more versatile, more stable, but it is more demanding because it's a bit more complex osteotomy. So you do essentially a double chevron. You are doing a double chevron, but the advantage is that you can have a big lateral shift. You can lower the metatarsal, as you can see here. The advantage of that is that the metatarsal pain is less because this metatarsal will still be load-bearing. You can also rotate the distal fragment to correct the DMAA. So this is a, a patient whom I did recently. He is a 16-year-old with a painful bunion, on, on more, more symptomatic on one side. So we did a scar for steodomy and a lateral release with excellent correction. Uh, this is another patient with hypermobility, slightly, slightly, different, uh, slightly different problem. Uh, the squeeze test where you squeeze on this side corrected all her deformity. So a simple scarf will not be helpful in this case. 
So in such cases, a TMT joined fusion is a better option. This is one of the, uh, I've got a bit of research interest in first MTP joint fusion. So this is one of the papers that we published in Journal of Foot and Angle Surgery uh, uh, a few years ago. So what we looked at was the first MTP joint fusion. And we found that the best angle for fusion is around 10 to 15 degrees of valgus and dorsiflexion. So when you do a fusion, fusion is a very good operation. What you need to, uh, you know, general tendency is to do flat on flat cuts. You make a cut around the P1, you make a cut around the metatarsal, and you have got two flat surfaces. But rather than that, if you keep the ball and socket shape intact, you can actually, actually achieve, your, you can fine tune your correction better because you've got a ball, ball there, socket there. You can put the proximal phalanx on whichever position you want uh, rather than going and recutting the osteotomy. So you, you put the P1 on the metatarsal, you put in a K wire, and you can do a fusion whichever, whichever way, way you want. Here we have used what are called memory compression staples. Rheumatoid arthritis is a common problem in India, a common problem with uh, hallux valgus in India. I mean, I won't say it's a common problem, but uh, hallux valgus is fairly common in rheumatoids. So this patient is actually an American lady who came here recently. Uh, she, as you can see here, has got severe hallux valgus. She has got a hammer toe deformity. This is a hammer toe deformity. Um, and her main problem was in the second toe because that was touching her shoes. So you can see that it's a degenerate joint. The joint is non-congruent. There is no point in doing an osteotomy here. The joint is beyond salvage. So the, the best treatment for this is a joint MTP joint fusion. The, the most stable construct for MTP joint fusion is uh, crossed screws along with a neutralization plate. So this is her after six Excuse weeks me. post-surgery. Uh, yeah. Time is over. Sorry, sir. sir. One more. So rheumatoid feet, these are very painful. Uh, they can have this walking on pebble sensation. So the best treatment for them is fusion of the first MTP joint and release these, uh, remove these metatarsal heads if possible, like in this case. These patients are uh, probably one of the most satisfaction, satisfying patients to operate on, as you can see here. Uh, she says that this has actually made the difference between heaven and hell. So rheumatoid patients are very grateful patients. These are, uh, I think, these are very good operations to do. Thank you.